All right, guys. Ball's in your court. Um, we uh, have this fundamentals of gas assignment that we're looking at. Today, obviously, we're going to build on these ideas and put a finer point on these ideas of pressure and gas behaviors and things like that. But guys, for now, let's get started here. Uh, let's take a moment together and appreciate my drawings. Yes, I did those myself. I felt comfortable doing this because they kind of look like beakers. What questions do you have? You guys really okay? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, and I, I don't know if this is, it looks like 27 is always related to pressure. Um, but let's talk about why. Um, and then let's talk about some conceptual stuff. So guys, fundamentally, by just be safe. Um, guys, fundamentally, um, you've got to understand these relationships. They're going to throw these things at you in multiple choice on the AP test. And you're going to get to these questions and you're going to think, wait, this is mathematical. I need my calculator. But guys, these relationships in Boyle's and Charles' law um, are, are very arithmetic. It's factors. Um, so looking in 27, um, guys, if you double the pressure, you cut the volume in half. So there's two important ideas. One is the scale of the change. Double the pressure, the volume gets cut in half. But guys, also the direction of the change. Remember that it's inverse, increasing the pressure. And guys, this is the pressure on the outside. Increasing the pressure cuts the volume down. That relationship also works with temperature. So guys, if you double the temperature, what happens to the volume? Doubles in which direction, bigger or smaller? Well, I know that's stupid, but you understand that, right? It gets two times bigger and not... Um, no, 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 don't do that to me. Go away. Um, so guys, it doesn't get two times bigger. It get. I'm sorry, starting over. Is it wrong I wanted to hit him? Is that? That's okay. All right. So, so guys, the idea here is that if you double the temperature, the gas gets twice as big and not twice as small. That's the direct and inverse relationships, right? Okay. So, again, fundamentally, when you see these on the test, it's not math. It's logic. But, guys, the thing that's interesting is, is the logic is contained in the math because you'll notice there's no exponents or even multipliers in this equation. So if, the, um, so if the temperature goes up, the volume goes up. If the pressure goes up, the volume goes down. We could show that by solving for the second volume. But notice there's no exponents, there's no multipliers. So all of these are direct relationships or math arithmetic relationships. The other thing is this. Make sure temperatures are in Kelvin, right? If you go from 50 Celsius to 100 Celsius, that does not double the volume because the temperatures have got to be in Kelvin before the relationships work. They will trip you up on that. They will say, you have a gas at 50 C, you heat it to 100 C. What happens to the volume? And it does not double because in Kelvin, that would not be a doubling of temperature. So that was a long answer to a short question. Did we do okay? Guys, go ahead, Kate. 35. Hold on. Oh, I made a table. Oh. I think it's seven. I believe is that isn't it seven? What just happened? Hold on. I don't know what. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Why is that doing that? Sorry. Just a moment. I have no idea what this is doing. Um, that is so strange. Um, I really, hold on a second, guys. I don't know what this is doing. Um, let me 
quit out of that. All right, I'm just going to fly solo. Um, so 760. So one atmosphere. So all of these are equal to standard pressure. So it's one atmosphere, which is equal to 760 tor, which is also 760 millimeters of mercury. So now you're going, wait, why millimeters of mercury? We're going to talk about it in a minute. But millimeters of mercury are the same as tor, and that number is 760. Um, and then you also need to know uh, kilopascals. I'm not sure if it was ever in this, but that, that conversion is 101.3. What else, y'all? Are we done? We're good? I'm more than happy to be done. Good? Okay. So, guys, let's get this recorded and um, then grab something you can write with. Um, I don't think he you needs your books. Um, so guys, why don't you just grab um, your AP equation sheets. Let me put this away. Hey guys, did we say, are we putting the, did we talk about when we're gonna stop putting things on second quarter's grade? So not this one. So guys, let, let's, um, Okay, I, I mean, I, I'm trying to be true to what I said. So we said we're done with stuff on second quarter's grade except for the rewrite of the test. Okay, so guys, we'll po I can't post-date this to third quarter because Skyward doesn't think that third quarter is the same class as second quarter. Um, so we're just not going to record anything um, simply because we uh, can't. So we're going to get rid of that. And Olivia is here. Were you playing in the snow? Did you fall in the parking lot? I fell in the parking lot. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, so, no, I mean, no, I just fell on my butt. But there were four people in my first period class that fell in the parking lot before school. Um, the other one of the other ones was my daughter. And we didn't come to school together. So I fell. She fell. Another girl fell and fell hard enough. She's like, I'm going home. Like she tweaked her back. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. You didn't have to admit that. Okay, that's fair. All right. I, I'm, I'm glad that you're comfortable with that. We're still recording. Um, <laughs> hey, guys, did I put grades up on the screen? I didn't, right? Nice. All right, here we go. So, guys, we are now going to move forward with our understanding of gases. Just laying this all out there. Today, guys, is going to be a potpourri. I've always wanted to say that. Um, it is going to be a cornucopia. It is going to be a random collection of stuff that you need to understand about gases. So, guys, that random collection is actually not random. It's up on the screen. Um, we are going to talk, first of all, about gas pressures. Then guys, once we've done that, we're going to move on and we're going to talk about an idea called partial pressure. Um, guys, understand that we're going to lay out the fundamentals and the conceptual ideas of partial pressure in class, but we're really not going to do a deep dive on it until we do this in lab, which will be after Christmas. There's one really important application of partial pressures that we will not get to till after Christmas. Um, I'm just praying that I don't put it on the test. Um, let me make a note to myself um, because we are obviously going to take this test. Um, so let me remind myself, no partial pressure on test. Okay, so I'll, I'll remember to take that question off. Okay, um, then guys, following that, we're going to talk about gas densities. Um, this is going to provide uh, an amazing foundation for what we're going to do on Tuesday, and then the test is on Thursday. And then guys, my plan for Christmas break, no chapter summaries, no homework, let's just take a break. Can I get an amen? <laughs> All right. So, guys, pressure first. So, we did 
I believe we talked about this last year. Let me check. Um, guys, last year, did we talk about the idea, and this we didn't do gases last year, but we did do phases of matter. And during that, guys, I, I believe last year we talked about the idea that when water boils, it not only has to break the intermolecular forces, it has to overcome atmospheric pressure. Did we talk about that? And then did we talk about the idea that that's why water doesn't boil at 100 degrees Celsius in Utah? Because we're higher up in the atmosphere, and as a result, there's less atmosphere. Some of the atmosphere is down here, and there's less atmosphere up here, and as a result, there's less weight sitting on the water, and therefore it boils at a lower temperature. Did we do that last year? Okay, so guys, let's use that then as our, as our connecting point. I need to bring my writing utensils back and hope this doesn't continue to misbehave. Um, so guys, let's let this then be our connecting point and you need, you need, to, you need, you need this equation. So guys, in, the, in this class, we, we quantify pressure. In, in uh, general chemistry, we talked about this weird general idea that there is gases pushing on us and pushing on water and making water not boil and all that other stuff. Um, but guys, fundamentally, you've got to understand that, that pressure has a definition. It is a force times area. And guys, it's important that you understand, and we'll write these down. It's important that you understand the units for this because this is going to be something you've got to understand conceptually. Um, so guys, when you hear the word force, whether you know the technical definition from physics or not, what is a force in layman's terms in our little world? Nothing? It's a push or a pull. Guys, that's all you need. A force is a push or a pull. So guys, when we talk about pushes and pulls, we need units that we can use to measure how hard we are pushing and pulling. And let's just be dirty Americans and let's use our units. Guys, what are the units that we use to measure the, the amount of push or pull? So now I'm pushing on a scale, and what do I know, know about me? My weight in pounds. So guys, our unit for, um, for uh, force in, in, Amer in English units is pounds. In, uh, in metric units, it's newtons, um, but we're good. Then guys, area. Area will always be measured in what kind of distance units? squared distance units. So guys, this could be inches squared. This could be meters squared. This could be centimeters squared. It's measured in some sort of square unit. So guys, it's critical that you understand the implications of what this all means. So let me give you some interest. Well, one is a little far-fetched, but true. The other one is fascinating if you understand it. So guys, let's talk about this idea of, of pressure. So guys, an interesting fact is this. Imagine an elephant, elephant standing on the ground. And now imagine a 100-pound woman all dressed up to go out for the night in stiletto high heels. Guys, it turns out that a 100-pound woman dressed in high heels exerts a greater pressure on the ground than an elephant. How does that work? It's all about surface area. Guys, elephants have huge stinking feet. And as a result, their weight, their force, is spread out over a big area. And consequently, you end up with a relatively low pressure. Conversely, a 100-pound woman focusing her weight on the toe and heel of a stiletto high heel, you've got more pressure. Not more weight, but more pressure. 
pressure on the ground than you would an elephant. Guys, keeping that in mind, you've got to understand that pressure is not just the force, it's also the area that it's spread over. So guys, why is that important to us? Because guys, understand that when we talk about When we talk about pressures, where's the force and where's the area? So guys, what are we looking at for area? Well, it's the surface area of the balloon. But what's causing the force inside the balloon? What's causing the force? The molecules of air, or whatever I blew in there, moving around and punching on the balloon. And as it punches, it exerts a push, a force that pushes out on this. And if we could measure the area of this and then the total force as these molecules push out, that would then give us the pressure. Get the idea? Now, guys, this gets even more interesting, and I don't know if you've ever seen these. Have you ever seen these things that they sell? And they're, they're like on infomercials late at night, and it's actually, it's, it's a car accessory. I had to do the math. I didn't buy it. But, guys, it is actually a car accessory that you can use to change your tire. So if you've ever had to change the tire in a car, you know you got to slide the jack under the car and you've got to jack the car up before you get the tire off, right? I don't know if you've have you ever seen these uh, pneumatic car jacks. It's fascinating stuff. I couldn't believe it worked until I did the math. Literally, it's an airbag. It's an airbag that's about... I don't know. It's, it's about three feet by three feet. So what would that be? That would be 36 inches by 36. In is that right? Check me on the math. So three feet is 36 inches and then 36 squared is 1,296 square inches. Did I do that right? Have you got okay? So guys, the way that this works is it's a it's an airbag that's about three feet by three feet, and then coming out the side of the airbag is actually a hose, and you shove the hose over the tailpipe of your car. And then you turn on your car, right? And guys, the way that this works is the pressure of the exhaust coming out the back of your car actually goes through the tube and it inflates the bag and it'll lift your car. And I'm going, wait, how does that work? But guys, this is how it works. Have you ever held your hand over the tailpipe of your car as it's running? It's just kind of going... Barely even any force coming out of the tailpipe of your car. So, guys, let's use units that we're accustomed to. So imagine if you don't do this, you'll burn yourself, but imagine that you put your hand over the tailpipe of the car. There can't be more than one or two or three PSI of pressure coming out the tailpipe of your car. But, guys, here's the trick. Imagine that there's three pounds per square inch. I'm going to write square inch this way. If there's three pounds per square inch of pressure coming out of the tailpipe of your car, and if you take that gas under a pressure of three pounds per square inch and put it in there, guys, that means that every square inch of that bag is now pushing out with three pounds of pressure. Now you do the math. 1,296 times 3. Guys, that's almost 4,000 pounds of pressure pushing up on that bag. And that's actually more, more push than your car weighs. And it lifts your car off the ground. Isn't that crazy? Absolutely amazing. So, guys, again, the point is this. Is your exhaust pushing with 4,000 pounds of force? No, but it is exerting three pounds of pressure. And if you can take that three pounds of pressure per inch and spread it out over a square yard, all of a sudden you're talking about lifting cars off the ground. Again, guys, the idea is you got to see the difference between pressure and force. Do you get the idea? Have you guys ever seen one of those airbag things? 
We'll look it up afterwards. Not a good Christmas gift, but um, they are actually out there. It's kind of crazy. So you guys good on pressure and force? And then, guys, you also then understand this, right? The, the idea is that we also have an atmospheric pressure. And, guys, this is the transition. We also have an atmospheric pressure. And so, guys, literally on top of us is this column of the atmosphere that's pushing down on us. And it also exerts a force. But, guys, we don't experience that force normally because it not only pushes in but it goes inside of us and pushes back out and we are in equilibrium and so we don't feel that crushing force simply because it goes in as well as out and it's all balanced and we're all good you guys good on the idea okay so then guys the question becomes this how do we measure that force of the atmosphere and so guys let's go there and uh, let's talk about it so guys first of all this and we've already talked about this but let's make sure so we've already talked about the fort wait where did this go oh okay um, and we already assigned units to this and so we're good there so guys now let's talk about atmospheric pressure so guys, again, atmospheric pressure is the pressure of the atmosphere pushing on us. And we measure this with what is called a barometer. So Kate, it was you that asked the question, um, what, is, what is a tor? And we said that a tor is uh, the same as a millimeter of mercury. So guys, where does that idea come from? And the answer is actually from a barometer. So guys, a barometer, and I, if you write it down if you need, a barometer is simply a column of mercury that is supported by atmospheric pressure. So guys, this is actually how a barometer works. Do you know my sad barometer story? Very sad. I don't, have you guys ever noticed, when we go into lab third period, look, when you go through the lab drawer, door, and if you take an immediate right-hand turn where the goggle cabinet is now, have you ever noticed that wooden plank that's screwed to the wall that seems to serve no purpose? You ever noticed that? Guys, that actually used to be where I had a really nice, really expensive mercury barometer. Um, and then about five years ago, we had an overzealous fire marshal come through our building. And her job is not only to make sure the school doesn't burn down. Miss, do you guys know about this? Uh, Miss Shaw's room freaked her out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was hilarious. This woman went running downstairs to our then principal, Mr. Browning. You've got to evacuate the school. Shut the place down. It was because they thought Miss Shaw's curtains were going to catch on fire. And because of my mercury barometer. Um, and she was just came unhinged. It was a mess. So luckily our principal told her, get out. Uh, but that was a whole nother story. But guys, this was the problem. This is actually how a, how a barometer works. So a barometer is literally a beaker of mercury. Um, and this is why there was a problem. Guys, this beaker of mercury has got to be exposed to the atmosphere because we're trying to measure the pressure of the atmosphere. And as a result, literally hanging on the wall was an open flask beaker of mercury. And mercury is a liquid, also evaporates. And technically, it was putting mercury vapor in the air. That said, I'd had it for 20 years and you couldn't even tell any of it evaporated, but she freaked out. But guys, here's the way that this works. Not only do you need an open vat of mercury, you also need a hollow glass tube. And this hollow glass tube is sealed at the top. And then what they do is they draw a vacuum on the tube. So they evacuate all the air out of the tube and then they invert it into this beaker of mercury. So guys, the idea is, up, is this. If this is a vacuum, what's up there? Nothing. And so the idea is that atmospheric pressure pushes down on the surface of the mercury. And when it pushes down on the surface of the mercury, where does the mercury go? Up the tube. And so the idea here, guys, is the more the atmosphere pushes on the mercury surface, what happens to the height of this column? Does it go up or down? It goes up. And then literally, guys, what we do is we strap 
a meter stick to the side of this and we read the height of the mercury column and that tells us atmospheric pressure. So that's literally how a, how a barometer works. So at standard pressure, the column of mercury would be 760 millimeters tall because it's 760 millimeters is one atmosphere and that's also 760 torr. So at standard pressure, this is the height of the mercury column. What is it always here in Utah, taller or shorter? Always shorter because there's less atmospheric pressure. You get the idea? So guys, understand, and I think we talked about this, we just use our phones to do this, right? And did we talk about how this works? Yeah, that there's actually a, uh, there's a, there's a member. Wow. Oh, I shut it off. Um, guys, there's actually a membrane inside of our phones. Um, you guys, did we ever talk about it? And the membrane deflects, and the higher the pressure, the more the membrane deflects. Is that good? Okay. So, guys, two things we need to talk about then relative to this, and we're going to move on. First of all, this. Why mercury? Why do we use mercury instead of a different liquid? Guys, the answer is because it's very dense. And here's the idea. Um, if we were to use a liquid, other, take water. If we were to use water as the liquid inside our barometer, it would work. But the problem is, is that the tube would have to be 30 feet tall. So obviously that's not practical. And as a result, we use mercury because it's highly dense. And so the idea is that pressure changes here don't drive the mercury as high up the tube because it's, it's less dense or more dense. Does that make sense? But you understand the implication of this, right? Guys, what that means is there is a limit to how long a straw can be for you to drink a Coke. You guys understand how straws work, right? Guys, when you drink through a straw, you are not actually sucking the liquid into your mouth. That's not how this works. What you're doing is you are actually taking the air out of the straw and then atmospheric pressure rams the, the soda up the straw and into your mouth. Literally, guys, all a, all, a, all a swig drink is, is a barometer made out of Coke instead of mercury. And you stick your lips up here at the top and you draw the air out of the straw and then atmospheric pressure does the rest and it rams the drink down your throat. And so, guys, the idea then is that there's a limit to how long the straw can be because atmospheric pressure has a value and there's only so much pressure pushing on your Coke, which means there's only so much height that the atmosphere can support your column of Coke. So if your straw is longer than that, you can't drink through the straw. But you also understand the other implication of this. Straws don't work in space. It's really true. Guys, straws do not work in space. Because how do straws work? Atmospheric pressure. What don't we have in space? Atmospheric pressure. Guys, straws do not work in space. But now you're going, wait a minute, maybe they do. So be careful what we're talking about. If you're in the space shuttle, you understand they, well, that doesn't fly anymore. If you're in the International Space Station, guys, they pressurize the cabin. They don't have to keep their spacesuits on to be okay up there. So they pressurize the cabin. So there is air pressure inside the International Space Station. So straws work there. But if you are outside the space station, straws do not work because there is no atmospheric pressure. Now, gravity is a whole nother issue. Gravity also plays a part. But guys, understand straws don't work in space yeah mm -hmm. yeah 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 they can squeeze them 
Yeah, exactly. And they squeeze. But it, and this, this means a lot to me as a coffee drinker. Actually, one of the astronauts got so sick of being in the International Space Station and not being able to sip his coffee. Um, and it wasn't a question of atmospheric pressure because they, they pressurized the cabin. It was gravity. And as a result, in zero gravity, you can't pour right? This doesn't have to do with pressure, it's gravity. So he actually figured out a coffee cup that works on the same principle you were just talking about so he can squeeze and then sip his coffee. Anyway, crazy stuff. So guys, go ahead. Yeah. Well, no. So, Santiago, that's a really interesting question. So, if you go up to the top of a mountain, in theory, your straw can't be as long as it was down on Earth or on, on sea level. But understand that we're still talking about the difference between like a 30-foot straw and a 29-foot straw. Um, if the air pressure dropped enough that your straw wouldn't work, you'd be dead because you wouldn't have any air to breathe, right? So yes, in, in theory, it, it wouldn't, couldn't be as long, but the difference would be hard to perceive. The thing that you really can perceive at the top of the mountain is boiling point. Um, because remember, the higher we go, the more the boiling point drops. And this is actually an issue for mountaineers. Um, you get up over like 18 or 20 thousand feet and water boils at such a low temperature that it won't cook pasta and it won't cook rice. Um, and those are two of the staples for high mountaineering folks um, because there are high density carbs and they're also very light before you cook them. So they melt snow and then they cook rice and pasta in there. And the, the temperature drops enough that you can't cook your food. So what do they do? <laughs> no, that would be, you could, but it'd be a lot of salt. Guys, what do they do to fix the problem? Pressure cookers. They, they will literally take pressure cookers with them. And that, of course, that, of course, puts a lid, right? And now all of a sudden when the water boils, it ends up up here, vapor pressure. But because the vapor can't get out, it pushes back down and it causes the boiling point to go up enough that it cooks their food. So interesting stuff, right? You guys good on all of this? Okay. So guys, this then brings us back. I don't think you need to write these down because we, well here, if you need a reminder of what the units then are for this, feel free to jot these down. So guys, these are our units for pressure. By the way, guys, as you're writing this down, here's an interesting point. So if you had measured atmospheric pressure in Utah on Wednesday, would it have been higher or lower than 760? If you had measured the pressure in Utah on Wednesday, higher or lower than 760 Tor? Lower, why? Because we're in Utah. It's always low. Guys, if it's ever higher than 760 Tor, something really bad's about to happen. Like, this could be like apocalyptic Book of Revelation stuff. So, guys, if you ever see a pressure above 760, call your friends and say goodbye. So, but guys, what about this? What if you recorded the pressure on Wednesday and then you recorded it this morning? Would it be higher or lower? Lower, why? The storm. Guys, our storms ride on low pressure cells. If you've ever watched the news and you see those big swirling H's and L's on the, on the weather maps, that's literally what that means. It means that we've got low pressure air coming into Utah and our storms ride on these waves of low pressure. And so, guys, when we have storms come in, you can literally see the pressure drop. But normally, the low pressure front is in front of the storm. And so, guys, even with the limited mountaineering that I used to do, we would keep a really, really close eye on our altimeters. 
And guys, understand this was, we didn't, we were so deep in the cell phones, dead batteries, no. So we literally had analog altimeters. And we would keep a really close eye on our altimeters. And guys, if the elevation started to change and we weren't moving, we knew a storm was coming. But here's the question. If a storm was blowing in, would our altimeter start to go up or down in elevation? It would go up because low pressure means storms, but low pressure also means higher up in the atmosphere. So when we would go to bed at night, we would always check our altitude and we're like, okay, we're at 13.5. And then if we got up in the morning and all our altimeter told us we were at 15,000 feet, we wouldn't climb that day because we knew there was a storm coming. Huh? So how then did we know our altitude to begin with? Ready for this? You had to read it off of a map. I know you guys are like your maps are in your phones but guys, we always carried topographic maps with us. And before we went to bed, we would locate ourselves on our maps and we would we would calibrate our altimeters off of a map and we would do that daily. So anyway, you guys get on all this pressure stuff. All right. So guys, now what we're going to do is we're going to take this idea of pressure and we are going to apply it to a concept. Come on, baby, don't do this to me. We're going to apply it to a concept called Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. You need to write this down. So guys, this is the simplest idea. This is, well, it's like unto Boyle's and Charles' Law. Until you really get into it, and then you're like, oh snap, this is different. So guys, what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay out for you the fundamentals of Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Along the way, have your AP equation sheets at the ready. We're going to reference that. And then, guys, we're going to play with this a little bit to make sure you understand the idea. Guys, this is going to feel mathematical, but go slow. You'll see. Just There are a couple things I'm going to have you not write down. So guys, let me define it for you. This might be a good time to do the announcer voice, but it simply says, the total pressure of a mixture of gases equals the sum of the pressures that each of the gases would exert if they were present alone. The total pressure of a mixture of gases equals the sum of the pressures if those gases were on their own. Now guys, just setting the stage, please don't write this down. We are going to look at this mathematically is a sum, but we're also going to look at it mathematically as a fraction. Don't write that down. That's just setting the stage. But guys, fundamentally, the idea is this. The total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the pressure of the parts. So guys, let's do it. Let's do it arithmetically first. What is going on? That's really weird. Guys, hold on a second. I think my board's possessed. Does it have a soul? That's so strange. Write that down. I just clicked on it and it went backwards, right? Am I making that up? So weird. All right. So guys, fundamentally, it's this. And again, this almost makes it sound like you want to do it in the announcer voice. Because guys, it literally just says this. The total pressure of a mixture of gases is equal to the pressure of component A plus B plus C dot, dot, dot. Find it on your equation sheet. Does it use A's and B's and C's? Hey, hooray. 
Where's it at? There it is. So guys, y'all found it, right? So mathematically, that's what that looks like. But guys, now we're going to do some mathematical gymnastics. Please don't write this down. But guys, there's an important implication of this that, that I want to show you. Well, let me ask. Do you guys hate it when math teachers derive equations rather than just telling you what they are? I know some people love that. I'm not one of those people. But let me show you where this comes from. Here's the idea. So guys, we're, let's make sure we're all there. So where we are right now is if you've got a mixture of gases, the pressure of the parts adds up to the whole pressure. Good? Okay. But guys, this gets a little more interesting like this. And don't write this. Just trust me. Don't write this down. Here's the idea. If this gas is an ideal gas, time out. What are the two oversimplifications for an ideal gas? The molecules have mass but no volume and no intermolecular forces. And as a result, pivnert. So guys, if these gases pivnert, they also nertva. So what I did is I solved pivnert for pa. And if you solve pivnert for pa, you get nertva. And now, guys, we can do some mathematical gymnastics and we can do this. See what I did? Take a second and drink it in. Don't write it down, but drink it in. So guys, what I did is this. I took this equation and I inserted nertva for pa for each one of the components of the mixture. Now, guys, let's do some canceling. So, guys, remember that we're talking about a mixture of gases. That means they're all mixed together in the same tank. And, guys, if they're mixed together in the same tank, are they at the same temperature? Yeah, they're in the same tank. And do they have the same volumes? Yeah, they're in the same tank. And then, guys, R is a constant. And look what we're left with. This is an important idea. And I am going to ask you to write down the statement in just a moment. But, guys, the important idea is this. The pressure of a mixture of gases is proportional to the number of moles of each one of those component gases there is. And you're going, what the snap does that mean? I'll show you. But guys, the idea is this. If you've got a mixture of gases, and if you know how many moles of each you've got, you can then figure out the pressure of each gas. So guys, this is the statement that you need to scratch down. The pressure that a gas contributes to a mixture is proportional to the number of moles it contributes to the mixture. Now, guys, you know me well enough to know that nobody loves a good PowerPoint animation more than me. But, guys, what I found is that trying to explain this to you does not work well with the PowerPoint animation. So what I'm going to have to do is actually escape out of the presentation and play with the raw slides. You guys all caught up? How about now? You guys good? Okay, so I'm just gonna make a mess. Um, clean this up, which will kick me out of the presentation. Grab a hold of this, click here, and escape. So let's shut this off. Let's zoom in and make this bigger. Not that big, however. Okay, so guys, again, I don't have the ability we're just going to have to do this in, presen in, in not presentation mode. Um, let me make it a little bigger. Okay, so there. So, guys, what I'm going to encourage you to do is I'm going to encourage you to draw this with me. Uh, make your circles about two inches across. 
And in the left-hand circle, please draw five dots. And then maybe in the right-hand circle, maybe draw yourself, well, ten stars. I don't know. Something that look, I've got the advantage of color. Um, so if you can do something to make these look different, that would be mo better. Mo better. Y'all good? Okay, so now guys, let's do this. Um, here, here are some underlying things that we have to agree on. First of all, these circles are all the same size. You buy it? Okay. And then guys, to make the logic easier, we're going to say that each one of these circles has a volume of a liter. Then guys, to make the logic even easier, we are going to say that the pressure of the gas over here is one atmosphere. And then guys, we also need to say the temperatures are the same, but let's not even write it down. But now guys, we need to say something interesting. If the pressure of the gas on the left is one atmosphere, and if the volumes are the same, and if the temperatures are the same, what's the pressure of the gas on the right? Two atmospheres. Let's write it down and then let's talk about it. So guys, why is the pressure of the gas on the right twice as much? twice as many particles. So guys, think about this. You don't need to write this down, but the logic is this. Pivnert. If you're solving this for Pivnert, and if you've got two samples of a gas, the volumes are the same, R is a constant, T is the same, so the idea then is this. If this has a pressure of one atmosphere, and if there are Five, let's call each dot a mole. It's just particles. So guys, if five dots, five moles, has a pressure of one atmosphere, then what's ten dots or ten moles going to have? Twice as many dots, twice the pressure. Do you now understand this idea of proportionality? So the idea is that if we've got twice as many moles, we've got twice the pressure if the volume and the temperature are the same. Is that okay? Okay, now guys, this is where this really starts to get interesting. You guys okay? Or well, are we good on that fundamental idea? Okay, guys, this is where this gets interesting and weird, and this is hard for me to do at the screen, so I'm going to do it from my computer. I can move these. Uh, all right. So now, guys, keep your eye on the middle container. What does the middle container have in common with our, with our left and right container? Same volume, same temperature. Good? Here we go. What is now the pressure inside that middle container? One atmosphere, right? What is the volume of that middle container? One, one liter? Good? Okay. Now, guys, this. Let's take that gas out. Oh, shoot. Oh, wait, hold on. I think this will be better if I go format. Uh, no, format, arrange, and push to back. Okay, so now that's going to be out of the way. And let me get rid of this. Okay, so now, guys, let's take this gas and shove it in the container. What is the pressure inside the container now? Two atmospheres. Pressure is two atmospheres. What's the volume? Okay. Now, guys, are you comfortable with those ideas? Okay, now we're going to do this one more time, and this is going to sound redundant, but it's not. The question is going to change a little bit. What's the pressure inside the container? What is the volume of the red gas? What's the volume of the red gas? One liter. Yeah? 
Tozvok. The gas fills the container, yes? So guys, one atmosphere, the volume of the red gas is one liter. Now guys, what is the uh, pressure in the container? Two atmospheres, what's the volume of the blue gas? One liter. Now guys, you see where this is headed. We are now going to mix them together. What is now the volume of the red gas? One liter. What is now the volume of the blue gas? How can that be? Because guys, think about this. Let's back this out. So guys, if I pull out the, the red gas, let's talk about the blue gas. What's the volume of the blue gas? One liter. But the blue gas is already in the container. So doesn't that mean when I put in the red gas, the red gas doesn't have access to the entire volume of the container? So the red gas must be a little bit smaller because the blue gas is already in there? Guys, the answer is no. The reason is because these molecules are so spread out that the red gas doesn't even know that the blue gas is there. And the blue gas doesn't even know that the red gas is there. They completely behave as if the other gas wasn't there. Does that make sense? As a result then, what is the pressure of the red gas? One atmosphere. What's the pressure of the blue gas? Two atmospheres. What's the total pressure? Three atmospheres. So guys, the underlying idea, and this is the fundamental thing behind Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures, is the other gases don't even know that the gases that are there are there. The red gas doesn't know the blue is there. The blue doesn't know the red is there. The red gets to use the whole liter. The blue gets to use the whole liter. They have their own separate pressures, even though the other guys are there. And the only thing that really comes together when they come together is their pressures add up. Does that make sense? Guys, that's Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. Anything there you need to talk about? You guys okay? You're good on the idea? Okay. So guys, this is expressing Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures as a sum. But there's one other way that we can muck around with this. And guys, we can actually express it as a ratio. Guys, this ratio is called a mole fraction. Grab your sheet. You know what? I'm going to do this different. I'm going to explain this to you based on what we already just talked about. So guys, we are now going to talk about mole fractions, but I'm going to come at this from a different angle. So, coming back to our red and blue guys, guys, we're going to come at this from a different angle and we're now going to talk about mole fractions. So guys, what we're going to do is this. Coming at this from a completely different angle, I think this is going to be a great way to explain this to you. So guys, here's what we know. Um, starting over. The only thing that we know is that there's three atmospheres of pressure inside the container. Three atmospheres of pressure inside the container. Good? Okay, now let's talk about this. Um, let's count particles. So guys, how many red particles do we have? We have five red and we've got 10 blue. And let's again say that each particle is a mole. 15 moles is a ridiculous amount of gas, but let's pretend. So guys, the idea is this. How many total moles are inside the container? 15 moles, is that okay? Five moles of red, 10 moles of blue, 15 total moles. So guys, this is 15 moles of gas. Is that okay? What's the pressure of the red? One. What's the pressure of the blue? Two. But how could you have known that if we hadn't done this before? And here's the answer. Guys, we have 15 total moles of gas. 
How many of those are red moles? Five. We have 15 moles of gas. How many of those are blue moles? 10. So guys, what, what ratio of this gas is red gas? A third. So if a third of the gas is red, a third of the pressure is red. That's one atmosphere. Now what percentage or what ratio of the gas is blue? Two thirds. That means two thirds of the pressure is the blue gas. Does that make sense? So guys, the idea is this. The pressure ratios and the mole ratios are equivalent to each other. So guys, find that on your AP equation sheet. Do you see it there? It's the second equation down under gases and liquids. So it says this, PA, the pressure of gas A, is equal to the total number of moles times X sub A. And guys, look at X sub A. Moles of A divided by total moles. Join me at the board. Guys, moles of A divided by total moles. Moles of B divided by total moles. Guys, these ratios are your X's. They are your mole fractions. Moles of A divided by total moles. But then what do we need to do in order to find the pressure of those component gases? All we've got to do is multiply it by the total pressure. Do you see that in the equation? Pressure total times the mole fraction gives you the pressure of that component gas. Guys, that's what we did here. One uh, is it okay if I don't switch to red? One third of the moles is red gas, so one third of the pressure, total pressure is the red gas. So one third times three, one atmosphere. Two thirds is our blue gas, two thirds times three is two. So guys, all this equation does is represent the logic that you understood on the board. You okay on that? Questions on that idea? Okay. So guys, we're then going to skip ahead in the slides. We've got one more thing to do. We are almost done. So um, if you did print the notes, here, let me undo my mess. Um, if you did print the notes, um, you'll notice that this is sort of the progression of thinking. Um, you can actually take this equation, cop just cross out what's left, the stuff that are the same, and you've got a mole ratio, and you've got a pressure ratio, and then guys solving for uh, pressure, you actually end up with this, which is the equation that we looked at. But I think the visual description was much better than that, so we're gonna go with that. You guys good on mole fractions? Okay, guys, we've got one more thing to do. Density, next big topic in your notes, last big topic in your notes is gas densities. So guys, this is going to look mathematical. Please don't try to understand gas densities mathematically. You will not be solving for this. So then the question is, why on earth are you showing us the math if we don't need to know the math? And guys, hopefully you're getting comfortable with the idea that mathematical equations are just representations of physical realities. So this is not an equation you need to solve, but it is a representation of some concepts that you've got to get. So guys, please don't write this down. But here's the deal. Guys, if we can take the ideal Pivner and if we can finagle it a little bit, turns out finagling actually is a word. It didn't underline it when I typed it. Finagle. I know, I was so excited. So guys, if we finagle this a little bit, we can actually restructure it and we get this. I don't want to talk about how we got there, but I do want you to write it down. Guys, it turns out that hidden inside of Pivnert, if you work things carefully, you can actually solve Pivnert for density, where density is mass divided by volume. You guys understand density. Density is mass divided by volume. But guys, I bring this up 
because you need to not know the equation, but you need to know the concepts. So guys, once you're done writing this down, let's talk about it. So guys, given this equation, how many factors determine the density of a gas? Given this equation, how many factors determine the density of a gas? Not four, three, because R is a constant. So guys, what are the three factors that determine the, the, the density of a gas? Molecular mass, pressure, and temperature, yeah? So guys, what you've got to do is you have got to understand how molecular mass and pressure and temperature influence the density of a gas. So guys, let's just make really sure. What mental picture do you have in your brain when you think density? Guys, if you can picture in your mind's eye a high density substance, what does it look like? What do you see when you think high density? All spread out? No, really packed together, right? And what do you picture when you see low density? All spread out. So guys, if we're going to think about this in terms of... Uh, this thing is really being crazy. If we're going to think about this in terms of really spread outedness, guys, let's kind of circle, or, circle around a common mental picture of a gas. So guys, here's what we then know, and I'll just bring it over from the previous side. It's molecular mass pressure divided by RT. So we're going to bring this over, and we know that density is related to the molecular mass and the pressure and R and T. So guys, let's do pressure first. This is the simplest. So guys, if the pressure on a gas goes up, if pressure goes up, what happens to density? Does it go up or down? It also directly related, right? If this number gets bigger, this number gets bigger, yeah? Guys, the question is why? This is where I'm gonna get here on my computer. So guys, grabbing a hold of my circle, what is going to change in your mind's eye that's going to make this gas more dense as the pressure goes up. What is the pressure due to this gas to make it more dense? Say it again. Why? And as we increase the pressure, the volume goes down. Says who? Boyle's Law. Right? Guys, this is Boyle's Law. As the pressure, and watch carefully, guys, as the pressure goes up, the volume goes down, and the density increases. But now, guys, we've got a problem. What is wrong with what I'm, what, there's a huge misconception in this. This is almost so wrong that I was going to not do it. But guys, there was no other way for me to do it. Kaylee, what's wrong with this? Yeah, the molecules are also getting smaller and they shouldn't. So guys, for this to be accurate, the molecules should also stay the same size as they close down. But there was no way for me to zoom one without also closing down the individual molecules. So really, the molecules could, should stay the same size. So imagine how big they are here and then imagine them still the same size over here. So these molecules should be a lot bigger, but fundamentally, as Preston said, you can see them getting closer together and that increases the density, right? Okay, so now guys, let's do this. What about temperature? As temperature goes up, what happens to density? It goes, and we can see that mathematically, right? As the denominator of the fraction gets bigger, we're dividing by a bigger number, making the value of the fraction smaller. But guys, let's do this. Starting again with our picture, what is going to change as the temperature goes up? Making the gas less dense. The volume goes up. 
Guys, you laughed at me last time when I said, hey guys, guess what? Charles Law, you heat up a gas and it gets bigger. <laughs> and none of you knew that. Right? So guys, understand, we, we said it jokingly and somewhat a little bit sarcastically, but guys, now all of a sudden it's a little more confusing, right? So guys, the idea here is that as the temperature goes up, the volume goes up, hot things get bigger. And as hot things get bigger, what happens to the density of the substance? It goes down. But again, guys, as Kaylee pointed out, the, the same mistake is present. As the balloon gets bigger, the molecules should not get bigger, and the spaces in between them are even more exaggerated. Do you get the idea? Okay, so then, guys, let's reset the clock. Now what about molecular mass? So guys, the molecular mass of the molecules. And at this point, we're talking about the difference between like a really light gas like hydrogen and a heavier gas like propane, which were the ones that we looked at last time. This has a mass of about two grams per mole. This has a mass of 36. This has a mass of about 44 grams per mole. So guys, as these examples go, um, what's the relationship between molecular mass and density? As the molecular mass goes up, what happens to the density? It also goes up. But now guys, what changes in your mental picture to explain this. If this is our hydrogen gas with a mass of two grams per mole, how would your mental picture be different to explain that the density of, of F meth pro propane, what would be the, ex what changes in your picture to explain that propane's more dense? What changes in this picture as we go from hydrogen to propane? I have a vote for size of molecules. Maddie? Dots get bigger? Others? Because, guys, that's not true. It's not the size of the molecules. What changes in your mental picture when you switch to propane? And the answer is nothing. Why? Yeah. It doesn't matter. Right? doesn't matter if it's an airsoft pellet or a ping pong ball. Guys, relative to the free space around these, the size of the molecules, what's our word? Insignificant. Just a second. So guys, nothing in our model changes because the size of these molecules is so insignificant compared to the space around them. It doesn't matter. So why does the density change? Just a second. Why does the density change when we go from hydrogen to butane? And the answer is simply because the mass of these things goes up and they're in the same volume. And if density is mass divided by volume, if we've got the same volume but the things in that space are heavier, the density goes up. So guys, this is a point where density is not really about packed tight together. This is a point where the things that are packed at the same distances just got heavier, but the sizes of them don't change. It's the masses of them that change. And again, guys, that's fundamental to Avogadro's principle. So guys, again, this is the hazard. And then Maddie, we're going to talk. Guys, gas chemistry is really, 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 really simple and easy until it's hard. And you're starting to feel that a little bit. You guys, again, were chuckling at Charles Law until you couldn't draw on it as an explanation for why temperature and density are inversely related. And guys, Avogadro's principle is really obvious. It doesn't matter if it's a tennis ball or a volleyball relative to the size of the bucket. The sizes of the particles don't matter. But when you had to apply that to this question, it wasn't immediately obvious. So guys, the question then is this, how do you make the obvious important enough to become a part of your thinking? And the answer, guys, is when you do this homework assignment tonight, don't be passive. Because I, I, I know, 
You do your homework, but guys, I would suggest that many times when you do your homework, you become a passive observer. You're checking your answers as you go. You got 11 things on your mind. You're just blindly writing stuff down. Because when you do this homework assignment, word by word, thought by thought, concept by concept, drink deeply of this stuff because the details are very important. Yeah. Well, but here's the, may I? Maddie, that's exactly where this is headed. And this is why we're doing density now and we're done. The reason is this. Let me clean up. Guys, let me foreshadow where we're going with this next time. So this is an ideal gas, right? The thing that makes it an ideal gas is that the molecules have mass but no volume. Why? Because the volume of the molecules is insignificant compared to the spaces around them. And we also say that these molecules don't have intermolecular forces because they're so spread out that they don't attract. Well, guess what? That's not true anymore. When these gases become high density gases, all of a sudden, and again, the molecules shouldn't have changed size, right? All of a sudden, guys, these, these gases are no longer ideal. That's why we're doing density now, because next time in class, we're going to talk about non-ideal gases. We call them real gases. And guys, in a real gas, which is just a high-density gas, in a real gas, the IMFs do matter, because the molecules are close together, high density. And in a real gas, the volume of the molecules does matter, because these molecules are so close together that the ratio of the volume of the molecules to the space between them is no longer insignificant. And that's where this is headed. Um, well, so be careful. So the things that we understand that influence density are temperature, pressure, and molar mass. Then we're going to talk about that as it applies to different gases. Um, but first, we have to understand that density connection. You guys good? Okay. So guys, here's what I've done. I've taken the homework assignment, and I've split it into two parts. Um, the first part of this homework assignment is about pressure and partial pressure. The second part of this homework assignment is about gas densities. Um, the answers are there. They're in order. Um, but guys, it, so just to sort of drive home this, if I can use the word delineation separation, um, the first part of this is about the first part of our day, and the second is about the second. So guys, thank you for a great morning. We're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to turn in our test rewrites, and then we're going to go over to lab. Um, but we are going to take a break, and then we'll go from there.